We're coming, and we ain't backing down. We don't need a bunch of cats in here. Yeah, looking in the mirror. I'm bitterly disappointed with the officiating today. Guys being dudes. And they run through our <laughs> like through a tin horn, man. <laughs> Thank you. Wait. Alex, the more things change, the more things stay the same. We take one Atlanta Falcons fan out of the podcast and replace him with another. No Stephen Godfrey this week. However, we are. Yeah, Stephen joined. hasn't been fired. He hasn't been deposed. To be clear, just this week. Uh, not yet. We are joined by Jason Kirk of a lot of different hats at the moment. You might know him as the co-host of the Shutdown Fullcast. You might know him as an editor at The Athletic. You might know him as the guy with the crickets in his background on various podcast appearances. Uh, to us, he's our former boss, current friend, uh, and a re- not a reigning, but a former champion of the FCS upset draft. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, fellas. Thanks for having me back. I, uh, I, I love to make my annual dip in through the, uh, through the independence preview. I feel so, I feel so uh, not tied down by any conference affiliations. So th- even though the independent roster continually changes over time. Yeah, well, conferences may not exist. Conferences may not exist, so who can say? Yeah, so this is the only thing that's actually real is, is independence. So two things that we're doing this week. Uh, we are going to do the FCS upset draft, which we have done for at least three years on this show and which Jason and I developed back in our old jobs at Vox. Like, I don't know, f- maybe five, four or five years ago now. It's been some time. Say 30. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, 30 years ago. It's one of the oldest institutions in college football. That's uh, right. We are then going to preview the four, just four, independent programs in FBS this year. Uh, but yeah, Jason, honor to have you. Jason and I were talking before we put the mics on. I actually don't think Splits and Duo would exist if not for Jason uh, in multiple respects. One, because Jason sort of put together our little team in a lot of ways. Like he was the reason that you and I ever started working together, Richard. But Jason actually was the first person to suggest that you, Godfrey, and I do a podcast together. So that's all your you fucking know. fault. Yep. That's Any <laughs> yep, exactly. Direct all if, complaints if, just straight to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you can find Jason's work at the Fullcast. You can find it at the Athletic. Uh, also, Jason is an author of budding repute with I think more than one thing that you should be aware is coming. But the place where you should keep your eye is shutdownfullbooks.com. I have that right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, newly launched uh, the world's only book publisher. Um, <laughs> Additionally, one other thing for this football season, this is actually an SCD exclusive news break, must credit okay. SCD, I haven't even said this on the full cast yet, um, but the watch grid, the schedule preview thing I've been doing since 2016. Indispensable, um, I will say. Thank yes. you, thank you. Just a snappy little preview of each college football Saturday, sort of categorizing snarkily uh, which games you should watch and which games you should consider watching. Um, I'm going to post it on my sub stack this year, jasonkirk.fyi, oh. free to you, the listener at home. Um, and perhaps you will consider uh, um, some gratitude for the free <laughs> service by visiting <laughs> shutdownfullbooks.com. That, that I, uh, newsletter with the watch grid is free, free with the promo code SZD, and you don't even have to enter it. <laughs> <laughs> you just find somewhere and type it, and sure, <laughs> text it to yourself. All right. It's the FCS upset draft. Uh, Jason is the only on-air talent who has ever been among the winners of this draft, as I was alluding to. I'll explain how it works. Uh, We have 115 games this year pitting an FCS team against an FBS team. Last year, there were eight FCS teams that won against FBS teams and 12 the year before that. So it does happen a handful of times or more every year that the team with 63 scholarships beats the team with 85 scholarships. But it's hard to get them right. Typically, if you draft two out of three, uh, you're going to get three picks in this draft. You have a decent shot at winning. Every game is in a spreadsheet. It has a point value of 3, 5, 10, or 100 points if you get it right, as arbitrarily handed out by a neutral committee. That committee (laughs) has one member that assigns the point values, and it is me. So we're each going to pick three. We will track over the course of the season who gets the most points. The most likely quote-unquote upsets are the ones that are just three points. While, for instance, if UT Martin beats Georgia and you pick that, you get 100 (laughs) points because we think that if you get that one right, you deserve to win the game. Uh, But if you just pick – If UT – 
Can we give if that UT one a thousand? Martin, yeah, if UT Martin sure. beats Georgia, we're renaming this podcast the UT Martin beat Georgia Hour <laughs> for it, perpetuity. Um, I, I will say some helpful hints for uh, for our friends at home. Um, week one is is prime territory for this to happen. Uh, you will recall last year, uh, Bryant almost beat FIU, taking them to overtime at home. Sorry, FIU is at home. Sorry. Uh, taking them to overtime and losing and ending up losing by a point. Um, Iowa's, Iowa beat uh, South Dakota State like seven to six, was it? With it like two close. safeties or some shit. And there was um, another one in week one last year. Yeah, week one is is prime territory here because as we talk about on this podcast pretty often, um, week one is typically a grab bag for uh fbs teams even really really good ones uh, uh, uh you will hear coaches say the most improvement often happens between week one and week two because obviously there is no preseason in college football which is also why some of the big hitter games are often quite sloppy in week one like florida state and lsu was last year yeah last year all of the eight upsets happened in the first four weeks of the season the vast majority of these games from the first three weeks uh delaware also beat navy in week one last year so Keep your eyes on those games. Uh, the way that this is going to work, uh, again, though, is that if you just pick a couple of three-point games, it's going to be hard because there's probably going to be a 10-point winner at some point here. Um, there, There is most years. There's a, a particularly surprising upset. So that's how we're going to do it. You can pick any game you want. The four of us are doing this. Actually, the three of us are doing this. We thought about giving Godfrey intentionally bad picks, but we're not going to do that to him. He said we could do that. We're going to be nice to him. The three of us are going to do this in draft style where the draft order was determined by who filled out the document first. Uh, that was me. <laughs> we are going to send Shocker. out the entry link Rigged. to this competition <laughs> to the Patreon subscribers at patreon.com slash SCD. So you can play as well if you're a Patreon subscriber. The first place winner or winners get to be celebrated on this podcast. We will send out t-shirts to the five top finishers when it's all done. Thanks a ton to our pals at Home Field Apparel. All right, fellas, it's go time. It's exciting, and we're going to use the preview picks to talk a little bit about the FCS ranks this season. NDSU isn't playing an FBS game. SDSU is not playing an FBS game either. Those are going to be the two best teams in the country, uh, at least Incarnate Word and Sacramento State, and some other significant playoff contenders are. Spoiler, though, I think the Dakota schools, the Dakota States, are going to be really good. Let's do it. I just mentioned them. UIW and San Antonio, week one. Uh, I like Incarnate Word to beat UTEP. Uh, I am looking, and this is a three-point game on the board. I am looking to get myself into the points column with an upset that I see as being barely an upset. Just UIW out Incarnate the fairway. Word is the, exactly, a fairway finder with a five iron. Uh, preseason number three team in the country, I believe, UIW. Uh, new coach there, G.J. Kinney left. He's at Texas State. We talked about them at the very, very end of the Sun Belt preview. But this team damn near beat North Dakota State in the FCS semis last year. Has an interesting read, uh, a reload this year, I should say, under the new head coach, Clint Kilo. Uh, lost 14 FBS transfers, most of whom were just following Kinney to San Marcos. But they have 20 FBS transfers coming down the other way. And a handful of FCS guys coming over from other schools, including Marcus Brown, who was an all MEAC defensive end for Howard. Note that according to the fine trackers of such things at Hero Sports, 20 transfers from FBS is the most of any FCS team. That's at UIW. Uh, I think UTEP has a chance to make a bowl this year. They have found competency under Dana Dimmel. But oh, I just, they, they also have a chance to very much yes, not make a bowl. They, I can tell they you always that. do. They always do have that possibility at UTEP. So uh, I just don't think the gap between these teams is very big. UIW was actually 83rd in the Jeff Sagarin rating last year of all of Division <laughs> One, and UTEP was 128th. So I think UIW might just be a better team, and uh, I think I have a good opportunity here to to put a field goal on the board early, put myself in a place where if I get a good pick later in the year, I could win this thing. This is the church of uh, the Bill C ratings, obviously, but I will tell you this. Sagarin's got good ratings. And Sagarin, like, Sagarin, Jason, I think, is the person who introduced me to Sagarin, of all people. We were cheating on Bill at one point in time. Because the, <laughs> the, it was before Bill got the FCS in and, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. It was good. Sagarin is just, I mean, the beauty of it, and Sagarin, Massey, a few others that just lump all of Division One together as if, you know, without, like, uh, making you um, 
uh, calculate what the FCS ratings might be based on. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. makes great sense. So that's where we're starting. We're starting in San Antonio with UIW. Richard, take us to New England with the second pick. Uh, a place I, uh, a part of the world I know quite well, actually. Uh, I am taking Holy Cross over Boston College. I think I called this shot during the ACC preview. Um, look, Boston College has a chance to be really bad um, this year. It, they, BC fans I, are I, mad at you for that. They don't. They don't agree. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sweet. Um, I I'm calling the shot here. I, I'm taking the Crusaders here. Um, I actually, I I wrote a story about, uh, Holy Cross's coach, Holy Cross's coach, uh, Bob Chesney has been at D3, D2, and now D1 FCS. And the guy has won everywhere. Winners win, baby. Uh, Holy Cross has really risen to become a preeminent, uh, rising FCS program. Believe they made the quarters or the semifinals last year. Um, were very highly ranked throughout the season. They beat Buffalo last year uh in buffalo uh i think they won on like a hail mary late in the game uh but they won that game so they have experience beating an fbs opponent the the stage won't be too bright the lights won't be too bright they will be able to act like they have been here before because they quite literally have been here before when not if when baby they take down the eagles um i the big thing for me with holy cross is that you know i i talk to their coach i wrote a story about fcs to fbs head coaches and making that transition i i sort of was like hey who's gonna do it this year probably dion here's another coach you should know and it was bob chesney um you know they what i like about them is what they do from a uh roster development perspective bob chesney's a special teams guy they they throw people on special teams they throw good players on special teams that's one of the things that good teams you probably know do uh urban meyer was like famous for this at florida and ohio state putting really good players on special teams like special teamers eat first like they make special teams not just the third phase they make it a legitimate phase of the of the system and that frankly helps you develop athletes you block you tackle you run on special teams i i like a lot um shane beamer notably was a former special teams coach who has made it to the big time i like the way special teams coaches think about the game and see the game which is why i i just was interested in Bob Chesney and interested in what was going on at Holy Cross. I wrote about it last fall at Sports Illustrated, and Holy Cross will be back to take down BC in, I think, week two? Don't know when that game is. That is a five-point game there uh, that is in week two. I made it a five-pointer because it's a Power 5 roster. Um, granted, a lower-end Power 5 roster, but I do respect that you're looking out for value um, where I picked a three-pointer for my first game. Jason Kirk, where are you going? Man, and remember, uh, Jason, a lot of, lot of responsibility here because the audience, the Patreon subscribers, are probably going to trail you quite a bit here. <laughs> yeah, who has Jason won both, all three times? He's won, he's I, won once. Okay. I won, I picked uh, FSU, Jack State, Washington when they had an FCS loss. I forget what else that year. I was just on fire. Montana State. Years. Yeah, he was on fire. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to attempt big swings only. Uh, should I pretend that our picks aren't already locked in? Should I pretend that these are being revealed live? That, sure. Yeah, of course. Like, I don't yeah, know yeah. y'all's picks, but I. Right, I, right. So I'm going to I'm going to say, I, oh, gosh, I'm so glad this one's on the board. I didn't think it would be <laughs> um, 10 pointers and up for me only. Uh, week one, we're going with the rare FCS FBS game that has its own internal storyline. Alex has mentioned this team already. Sacramento State traveling to Stanford where Troy Taylor Faces his former team. Um, this is a, yep. this is a bet on a good FCS team against a likely bad FBS team. Uh, Sac State top ten across the board um, in FCS. Stanford is starting over from kind of nothing, and you know they're not really a school that's going to be able to plug in um, twenty five portal guys. So <laughs> yes. it could take a while. Um, the reigning Big Sky Conference co-champs, Big Sky Conference, best conference in college football because they sent me a hoodie last year, home field apparel hoodie, by the way. Um, they were four points away from hitting 13-0 and last year. Um, one of the guys they bring back, Marshall Martin, is a tight end, wide receiver, et cetera, tweener, a uh, great athlete who could make the NFL. Uh, last year beat Colorado State 41-10. Granted, Colorado State barely FBS, but still um, – yeah, this one's in week three for 10 <laughs> points. Uh, I would like it more in week one, but I, I love the 10 points. And 
that kind of approach, that rigorous analytical approach to the FCS upset draft, is why you've had so much success in this game. Uh, Stanford, I am going. Sa- oh, well, go ahead. I will say Stanford, tricky proposition. In a close game, Stanford has like the best kicker in the country, um, or at least the best returning kicker in the country. So in a close game, you know, David Shaw was putting this guy out to hit like 61 yarders when it didn't matter, and he was nailing right. him. He, he was right. like, didn't he like didn't he hit like a record setting field goal to like push a game over? Yes. And it was like yes. they were down by like 10 as yes. time was expiring. This was um he was 18 of 18 field goals last year, including one game in which uh he hit 5 and Stanford won 15 to 14. If you're a math major, <laughs> you will note how scoring is done in the sport of football and how Who much five against? field goals. That must have been Cal. I think it was Cal. I'm not entirely sure. No, I, I think can't they remember lost the Cal game last year. Anyway, uh, someone is yelling at their TV that we were yelling at their car radio. Maybe you're watching this on. Maybe YouTube. you're watching it on YouTube. Don't yeah. don't short shrift the YouTube audience. No, I don't I know how you would how you uh, take this in. Thank you, YouTube. We love you. Splitsundio.com. YouTube. Sorry, YouTube.com slash splits. Jesus Christ. Uh, the YouTube audience. Two. Put in the if you're watching on YouTube in the comments, just say how much. Alex has disrespected you right now. Just comment it right now. Absolutely. And like as well. And subscribe and all those things. Of course. Uh, second round of the draft here. Uh, I'm going to the state of Iowa. So UNI plays Iowa State in week one. This is a 10-pointer. And I'm taking it. I think that you probably do need to hit on a 10-pointer to win the FCS upset draft. And I seriously thought about making this one a 5-pointer. And the only reason I didn't was that U- was that UNI was not – that good last year they were a six and five team iowa state has what seems like a possibly absurd number of players who may not be playing in this game or in fact any other game that iowa state plays this year because they are accused of betting on sports uh and in some cases betting on their own games and in at least one case betting that iowa state would lose their own games so you know it's sort of a triple whammy there. Um, sort of as bad as it can be, I think, is when you're betting against your own team. Uh, and I don't know that we are going to have a harmonious season in Ames this year. I, I also don't know exactly where the number will settle in terms of like how many players are going to be suspended or perhaps banned from college sports. But I think it's going to be more than zero. It seems like their quarterback, Hunter Deckers, who I don't think was even that good, uh, may very well not be playing at least at the start of the year. UNI, pretty good Missouri Valley team that has been competitive against FBS and even this FBS team in particular in the recent past. They have the best quarterback in this game, even if Deckers is playing. That's Theo Day, former four-star Michigan State player who took a big step forward last year through 26 touchdowns. I just think UNI is pretty good. Iowa State's a huge mess, and I could see this going pretty badly for the clones. So give me... Give me Northern Iowa for 10 points. That's uh, a great pick. That's the rare um, betting-aided betting, right? Like That's always when you, when you right. get to. That's yeah. betting-aided betting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hasn't Northern Iowa done this before to they Matt took Campbell? Iowa State, they took Iowa State to overtime a few years ago, and I think like Brees Hall bailed out Iowa State in that game, or, or you and I just couldn't score. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's not unprecedented for this specific Iowan team, which by the way, like has has some players. Like they had a first round left tackle get picked a year and change ago. Like like you and I develops players. They've done that for a long time. Uh, that was Trevor Penning, if you were wondering. Like I think that they could win this game, and so taking it for ten points. Uh, I will be taking. I believe it's a five pointer, but Alex, uh, let me know if that is wrong. I am taking Idaho. Against Nevada. Um, Nevada was... Oh, it's a three-pointer. It's a three-pointer. Three pointer, excuse me. Yeah. My next one is a five-pointer. Thank you. Um, I would, I, Idaho and Nevada. Um, Idaho has an honest-to-God quarterback. Uh, Giovanni McCoy, decent player. Uh, had, t- I think, 28 touchdowns last year. Uh, Hayden Hatton is a wide receiver who, at one point in time, scored four touchdowns and a half last year, I think. Uh, so that was pretty dope. Nevada was just a horrific football team last year. Um they it was it was tough i mean they beat new mexico state you know um they beat texas state you know um lost to hawaii lost to hawaii but also alex you will note lost to incarnate word baby and it wasn't particularly word. close and that was in like week three um 
so again, this is a this is a have you been there before moment, and and I do think that Nevada unfortunately has been here before. They will know how to act, and I don't mean in a good way. So give me Idaho over Nevada. I like that pick. I think having a three pointer, like look, you pick two, you pick two three point games, you make one of them. That's fifty. Like Steph Curry didn't shoot. 50% from three. Mm-hmm. So I think that there's something in there if you can pick a couple three-pointers and get one right. Jason, what do you think? Richard, I love the pick of Idaho, and uh, I am, in fact, going to believe even harder in the Vandals than you did. I'm taking Idaho at Cal <laughs> week three for 10 points. Um, like you said, I love the passing game, the quarterback, the top receiver. They have another 1,000-yard receiver, um, and additionally, one of their best receivers from two years ago is coming back from injury. So, like, FCS's best passing game, quite possibly. Um, We also have schedule factors here with uh, Cal coming off a game against Auburn and a look ahead at Washington. Um, Plus, you know, Idaho last year, they were, uh, I think it was like 20 yards away from beating Washington State, which granted FCS team over Washington State, not that that big of a deal, but still it counts. Um, Yeah, I I, I like what Cal did in the portal, um, but I got to just go uh, all big sky as long as I can. And, uh, We'll see if Idaho can go two and zero here. Then we all then we all go home happy. Yeah, I can't endorse a pick against Cal because as I've talked about, I'm I'm wondering about Cal this year. I think they could take a step forward. And uh, you know, Jason, I do think it's interesting that you're insistent on kicking Cal and Stanford while they're down. These two humble, downtrodden institutions that may not even have a conference after next year. I just and don't believe in the ACC, are Alex. Belittling them. I don't think Florida State does either, so that's okay. (laughs) You're not alone. Uh, Idaho does have, by the way, uh, a coaching situation that I think is is interesting and makes you wonder if they could get really, really good. Their coach is Jason Eck, who had been the offensive line coach and the offensive coordinator at South Dakota State, where they obviously uh, create quite a bit of power and beef in their management of their offense, and he was the guy who oversaw that. So Idaho is preseason FCS number 13. Uh, this year, his old school SDSU got 24 of the 25 first place votes in that poll. Also, I think I Scott, said UIW was fourth. They're seventh. Uh, Scott Linehan's son is also on this staff, by the way. This Idaho staff. That's some really good guy remembering. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> you got to uh, remember some guys, baby. Round three, uh, as we wind our way through the FCS upset draft, uh, I'm taking another in-state game here. I'm going to take Southern Illinois to beat Northern Illinois uh, in week – oh, I should I should have this one off the top of my – off in week two. Uh, this is another three-pointer, and so I am sort of hoping I, – I, I think I have questions about my own point management strategy here, <laughs> but I'm hoping that – Perhaps I can sweep these uh, and then be in good position. Sagarin had SIU at 123 and NIU at 133 last year. Another case where the FCS team was quite possibly better or seems to at least have been pretty equal with the FBS team. NIU could get better, as we talked about in the MAC preview. This is a very up-and-down program. Could be anywhere from the best team to the worst team in the MAC, and it wouldn't be all that surprising. But their best player, Harrison Whaley, is at Wyoming now, the running back. It's very possible that they just don't have a lot of juice this year. Meanwhile, Southern has a pretty good quarterback by the name of Nick Baker. They got some other all-conference guys scattered around this roster in a league that is really just as good as the MAC. Like, I think that the Missouri Valley Football Conference is, at the high end, pretty definitely better than the MAC and maybe just better overall, though I'm not entirely committed to that take. Uh, and you have a pretty decent team in that league in the case of SIU. So let's do it. Let's let's try to shoot at least 50%, like I was saying, on my three-pointers. And let's take Southern Illinois over Northern Illinois in week two. Uh, I am, I'm taking a five-pointer here because, again, like you can hit a ten-pointer if you want, but when all three of my picks hit, I will then have 11 points and then be the victor. It, the math is mathing here. Uh, So I will be taking William and Mary over Virginia, a local Derby game, a Derby match of FBS versus FCS. What we don't love about this game is that it is week six. Um, Virginia obviously was not very good last year. 
Uh, they did dispose of no. their FCS opponent uh, quite handily. Part of that is because they're you know pretty decent up front, especially on defense. Jameer Carter is a great player. Um, so, yeah, they're probably going to push William & Mary around uh, sufficiently. But I will say this. William & Mary runs like an insane offense. If you want, like, what, cut yeah. on some highlights of William & Mary. There's like, f- like two quarterback trick plays and fucking – you know, triple out of the shotgun and all this kind of stuff. Like they do s- some pretty crazy stuff, with motions and shifts. Uh, Bill and Mary is a really fun on offense. Look, I, I don't think Virginia is going to be that bad this year, but it's one of those things where it could break real bad, real bad for Virginia if they just can't score. Obviously, they're replacing pieces um, on offense with Brennan Armstrong leaving, Tavion Wicks is leaving. Um, they are they are losing some guys on offense, and and we'll have to replace those. So look, you know, one of their biggest transfers, I, I think, is like a Monmouth transfer. I don't know who they're playing at quarterback. Um, so you know, yeah, it it could yeah. break quite poorly for Virginia, and when it does, my FCS upset draft pick will be there. Yeah, Richard, you've done a good job this year picking games that were on the fringe of being a lower point value. Like I thought about this one as a, as a five and I made it a 10 because it's a, a power five team again, kind of like BC, but maybe not a good one. Probably not a good one. I think you might be, you might be onto something with this. I like your strategy, Jason. I think this is a great pick as well. I would have had it next if I wasn't committed to taking a 100 pointer every year. Um, the other thing about Bill and Mary, two All Americans on defense, so not just not just offense this time around. Um, my big swing this year, uh, and this is no shade to the team I am picking to uh, to be on the losing side here, nor the conference that I keep picking on. Um, Weber State at Utah in Week Three. This is strictly about trying to find the um, the most equitable possible pairing within the hundred point games. Um, I looked for a game in which the FCS team is as good at FCS football as the FBS team is at FBS football. Um, Utah, top 15, top 10 type team. Weber State could very easily be in there as well. Um, Very short road trip. (laughs) It's like 30 minutes. Um, I also like that Utah starts with Florida and a trip to Baylor. Um, This, you know, very good chance they view this as a little bit of a rest game. Um... You know, Weber State, it, it, I like the offensive line, so it, they have a chance to not get bullied around by the Pac-12 bully team, at least when they have the ball. Um, and they beat Utah State 35-7 last year. So let's let's keep going to just, yeah, that was just collect wild. all the in-state yeah. um, trophies. There should be trophies. So that's uh, three big sky over Pac-12 all in the same week. <laughs> if you're wondering what the other 100-pointers are, we've got 16 100-point games this year. Uh, and if you're, again, a Patreon subscriber, we'll, we'll probably post the point values publicly, but if you're a Patreon subscriber, you can go shopping for yourself with a chance to win home field stuff. Mercer and Ole Miss, Portland State, Oregon, Tennessee State, Notre Dame. Notre Dame playing an FCS team, something that has maybe never happened. I think we've talked about that before. Uh, UT Martin in Georgia, Youngstown in Ohio State, Delaware, Penn State, Charleston, Southern Clemson, Austin P, Tennessee. McNeese, Florida, Grambling, LSU, Nichols, TCU, Bethune, Cookman, Miami, Weber, Utah, North Alabama, Florida State, Chattanooga, Bama, Abilene, Christian, Texas A&M, which Aggies, that was charitable of me to make you a 100-point game, but I really can't see it. Uh, they c- come on. I, I can't see it. I can't see it. I can't. I couldn't see it. I, ch- I wanted to make it a 10, but I really couldn't see it. <laughs> I uh, think I picked that difference. one last year, I think. <laughs> I thought about doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> the talent difference is a little, a little large. Uh, what is? What do you? That... What do we think is going to be the most lopsided FCS FBS game? Don't pick the Tennessee game. Besides the Tennessee game, where obviously Tennessee is going to score a hundred points. Probably like Miami stunting on Bethune Cookman or something like that. Just to feel good. So that for once. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just yeah. to feel something. Like, that's that's probably that's probably what probably what it will be. Uh, I Ole will miss Mercer could be a lot of points. Mercer's good. Yeah, I I, I could think be high look, scoring. <laughs> looking at the board, um, looking at the board, you know, it, you're tempted to take Chattanooga at Alabama, but remember, he will call the dogs off on an he FCS will. team. He will he call will. the dogs off on an FCS team. 
Um, and Lord knows what, what Alabama has at starting quarterback, much less uh, backup quarterback in the spot where Alabama's up 40 in the you know end of the third quarter kind of thing. Um, Portland State at Oregon, the fighting Justice Muscatas uh, – going into going into Oregon justice I don't know what you're going to do about this big guy this is this is the alma mater uh against uh against your favorite school so I know this is going to be tearing you apart inside but I do think Bo Nix and the lads may uh may may put a hurting on uh, on Portland State did you guys see that the other day Alabama released like university shot b-roll of the three quarterbacks in that race throwing you know very regular passes at their workout at like fall camp and there was a lot of discussion about what was happening there like on the one hand was was nick intentionally instructing the team to keep it very vanilla and not show anything interesting or on the other hand was it one of those like propaganda films from a banana republic <laughs> where you're showing the citizens having Prospering. having great having great health care, going to the grocery store, enjoying public spaces and everything as well, when in reality that grocery store is is a film set. Like there were questions <laughs> being raised, at least in my head, about what Alabama was doing with that video. It could be Jalen Milro could be either thing. Jalen Milro blinked twice if you can hear this. <laughs> I guess we'll find uh, so, out uh, if these quarterbacks are crisis actors at some point soon. <laughs> so that's the pick, uh, Chattanooga over Bama. Uh, not even against the spread, just straight up on split did we, um, Jesus Christ. <laughs> did we have any other games on our board as well? I had two. Go, please, please. We're had, good. Uh, tell, tell me what you were intrigued by. Yeah, Albany at Hawaii in week two for five points. Boy, that is a road Reverse trip. body That's clock. quite a road trip. <laughs> <laughs> Albany What's returns the almost everyone. Um, What's the theory uh, there? That would be – okay, go ahead. It's yeah, just interesting. Albany just returns two. basically everyone. Five one-score losses last year. Hawaii will be very bad. And the, the, the going west, the road trip element of it, yes, that's about as far as you could possibly go while still playing American college football. Um, but, you know, Hawaii is actually not all that great at home, like – typically one of the worst teams against the spread at home so i felt decent about that um albany should be like a mid-tier fcs team which i think it equates to bottom tier of fbs uh and also i had just to complete the big sky <laughs> sweep i had idaho state against utah state by virtue of nothing but that being a 10 pointer with utah state involved um i'm fine betting against utah state is my entire reasoning there i uh i was pretty curious personally uh, about Stephen F. Austin and Troy. Pay attention to that. Look, Troy's not breaking any scoring records on offense. So if it's one of those things where they come out, you know, chug, chug, chugging along and they're not able to do much. I know Stephen F. Austin is not exactly an FCS power program at no. the current moment, yeah. but I'm just saying, could happen. Is that a 10? I think it's a 10 pointer. That is a 10 pointer, yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm not I picking thought... it. I'm saying it was. It was close to my boy. It was, it was, it, it's, it's the undrafted, it's my undrafted free agent of the FCS upset draft. I thought about Southeastern Louisiana in two different games, both 10 pointers. One was Mississippi State, one was South Alabama. Uh, both probably a little bit more defensively competent and also not going to break scoring records this year. We'll see what Mississippi State looks like under Zach Garnett, but. I considered it with a top 15 FCS team. I also wanted to pick Furman against South Carolina, kind of on the same theory that Jason used for Weber State to beat Utah. But I just think South Carolina is going to score too many points. Yeah. So, like, I, it's it's not your older brother's South Carolina that oh. you could see having, like, a Citadel moment, which they did, and they lost oh, to the Citadel a couple years ago. I don't think that's going to be the same thing. Also, uh, depending on if like rap videos are being shot in the locker room or not, de to, to determine who will be playing, yeah. Florida A and M and USF week two, early on for the Alex Golish regime regime there at USF, it's a five pointer on our board. Florida A and M been very very good and competent in uh, in the FCS the last couple of years, made the playoffs, uh, almost beat Dion's Jackson State uh, two years ago pay attention to that that that's another one of my undrafted free agents this year love that that's the 2023 fcs upset draft those are our picks uh we will make godfrey fill out the form when he returns or he can sandbag whatever he whatever he chooses 
Jason Kirk, thank you for being with us. Will you hang around for some quick independent previews as we go back to FBS? I will I will hang on. I need to read something, but I will be here <laughs> as soon as I finish reading it. It's very comforting, honestly. <laughs> Jason can take take that break during the ad read during podcast business. Today's show and everything else that Split Zone Duo does exist because of you, the listeners. And we've already talked about the Patreon a couple times this week. If you join, you can play in the FCS Upset Draft. You can compete against a community of approaching 5,000 college football fans who I am guessing feel about the sport, perceive the sport in a very similar way to the way that you feel. Uh, we think that we have been blessed with an incredible community of people who literally make this work possible. Uh, and we also think you get a pretty damn good deal. You get a lot of podcasts from us for as little as $5 a month. You get Richard's Scheme School series. You get my Dead Letter series. You get Stephen Godfrey's single wing episodes. You get regular Q&As and things of that nature. It's a great – I think I think that it will be a great, a great addition to your college football experience if you join the Patreon at patreon.com slash scd for as little as $5 a month, and you can play in the FCS Upset Draft. Also, speaking of the great community that we have been fortunate to have here at Splitzone Duo, Getting excited to see many of you in Minneapolis on the Friday of Labor Day weekend. That's September 1st. Godfrey, Richard, and I will all be there for our Split Zone Duo live show driven by our our, our friends and partners. I was going to say both words at once, but they're, I don't know, fartners, friends, <laughs> our friends and partners <laughs> at Nokian Tires. It is driven by them. Uh, we're going to have a hell of a night. We are going to have the folks from the $5 Bits of Broken Chair trophy and charity there with us as well. It's right in the midst of a really busy college football weekend in the Twin Cities. You got Minnesota, Nebraska on Thursday night. I'll be there. I'll be tailgating. See you out there. Uh, there's also a big FCS game, North Dakota State and Eastern Washington on Saturday. And the State Fair, I believe, is going on. Also, I think Pearl Jam is in town. There's just a lot going on in the Twin Cities that weekend. So we would love to see you at Tom's Watch Bar for Split Zone Duo Live, driven by Nokian Tires. That's on Friday night, September 1st to Start or, or in the midst of your Labor Day weekend, SplitZoneDuoLive.com is the place for tickets. If you use the promo code CHAIR, you get 15% off. Uh, or there's another discount code, even bigger one, um, for Split Zone Duo patrons via Patreon.com slash SCD. If you just search back through our Patreon page or look in your inbox for that. Also a huge thanks to our partners at Home Field Apparel. You can check them out at HomeFieldApparel.com. And use the promo code SCD20 for 20% off your first order. Our thanks to Homefield for their sponsorship. There's a reason that when we do the FCS upset draft every year, the winning prize is Homefield merch. Because what could be a more fitting prize and a more comfortable, more attractive prize for a conference for a competition in which your job is to pick often obscure but very much beloved college football programs to pull off upsets? I think that there is nothing that could possibly be more home field than that. Uh, and we are honored by their continued partnership. Also honored to be wearing, I am right now, a long sleeve t-shirt. I think I don't think I owned any home field long sleeve tees, but they sent me some excellent pit stuff the other week. So I have been rocking my, I've been in the home field quarter zip game, in the home field long sleeve tee game. Uh, I've always been in the crew neck and hoodie game with home field. But the point is, folks, it's not just t-shirts. It's all kinds of extremely comfortable, vintage, and officially licensed collegiate apparel. Homefieldapparel.com, promo code SCD20 for 20% off your first order. Gentlemen, the independent preview. Bow, bow, bow. The last conference. The last Potentially, conference, that's we right. May, we may be returning to independence here with, depending on how this deal shakes out here. You know, we could have as many as, you know, Stanford, yeah. Cal, maybe Florida State, Clemson. If they get uh, if they get particularly frisky, who knows, man? It could be return of the independence in the next few years in college football. Nineteen ninety one is so back. Nineteen ninety, <laughs> probably nineteen ninety. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like if if look if you're a young and listen to the podcast, Penn State, Miami, Florida State, all used to be independents. It was a, a thriving class of independents yeah. in college football. There used to be. It's always wild to yeah. go through sports reference and like click from year to year and watch the independence pile just slow. Yeah. Shrink over time. <laughs> We've got four left. Uh, Liberty and New Mexico State are now in Conference USA. So we are sitting on just these four. Uh, a shame because we won't get to hear Jason talk about Liberty this year. Uh, <laughs> but that's for the Vacation Bible School podcast. 
which you, oh, I didn't even mention VBS. You should also check out the Vacation Bible School podcast. Uh, let, let's start, Richard, at West Point with uh, the school that you recently visited to do a little, a little feature on, actually a big feature for Sports Illustrated. Uh, the thrust of your feature, of your reporting, is that Army is not going to be a triple option team anymore. Uh, why are they doing it? How serious are they about this? And what's it going to look like if they are serious about this? So last summer, there was a rule, uh, last spring, I think. Last spring, there was a rule change um, that basically nuked the option. We talked about it when it happened on the show. Um, in a nutshell, it is very difficult now to block below the waist, either outside the tackle box or when you are not an offensive lineman. Um, it is, it, it's virtually impossible if the refs are paying attention to it, and particularly Frisky. I, I, me and Alex differed on the opinion of how much this was going to neuter the option. I did not think this was going to really harm them. I thought they were basically going to be able to figure it out. Uh, Jeff Munkin, Army's head coach, told me uh, that he found out about this rule change during spring practice uh, and that they were, spring practice of 2022, and that they were unable to, to do really any changes. And so they kind of rode with it into the season um, to, to see what, what would happen there. They got halfway through the season, and Munkin basically figured out, like, we can't run this anymore the way I want to run this. Um, and, folks, if Jeff Munkin is telling you he can't run the option, oh, it's hard to run the option. Jeff Munkin of uh, Georgia Tech when, uh, when Paul Johnson was there, uh, also obviously with him at Davy, like, it, you know, Jeff Munkin has been around the block and has run this option system. Now, that the, the feasibility of the option itself is one thing. The other thing is, and it's an under the, it's an undercurrent thing. If Jeff Munkin is ever to get another job, a non army job, him not running the option will have significant bona fides. Um, you know, he has been, as I understand it, shut out of jobs previously because effectively he won't win the press conference because he is thought to bring an option offense. Now, I don't think he would run the option at another school. I think he runs the option because of the particular constraints of being Army's head coach or ran the option past tense. Can I ask you about that? Can I pause you? Yeah, those yeah, constraints, yeah. Those constraints are, are why they do this. Like, you yes. can get a certain – think about the body of the young men who would go to West Point, and it's like you don't have a lot of 320-pound offensive lineman types. You don't have a lot of 4-4 four, four running receivers – but you have solidly built upper medium sized guys who are perfect for the option. Like what's going, like, are they going to have all, like just put like all of their offensive linemen on the Michael Phelps at the Olympics <laughs> diet here or I, so, so I'll get to that in a second because like that undercurrent, uh, that option undercurrent is, is legitimate. Like Ken Niamatololo, who was formerly Navy's head coach, obviously ran the option was shut out of the Arizona job quite famously by uh, a former quarterback there, Khalil Tate, who basically tweeted, I ain't running the option. And it, it, on purpose, by the way, uh, and, and his candidacy for that job tanked. So there's a couple reasons why Army's going away from this. Army is going to, A, get into the shotgun. B, they're going to, I think they're going to pass a little bit more. I don't think they're going to be an air raid, but I do think they're going to pass a little bit more. But they're going to be running a lot of RPOs and triple option concepts out of the uh, out of the shotgun. It's just not going to be flex bone under center as we know it. Now, Navy's not doing this, by the way. Navy's sticking with the option for now. Brian Newberry, their head coach, comes in, um, and, and they're going to continue to run the option here, and so we'll see how that works. They've brought in uh, Jason's alma mater, Kennesaw State's, uh, I believe, head coach to be an offensive coordinator hoot, there hoot. here in year one. Hoot, hoot. Um, so Navy's continuing with the option. Air Force abandoned the flex bone triple option years ago. Um, but Army's going away from it. And, you know, going to spring practice when I did and kind of seeing in the early stages of development was interesting. I mean, it, you know, we were talking to one of the quarterbacks and and the the skin, like, under his, uh, kind of in his armpit, was, had like, had an abrasion. And he was like, yeah, I, I have been throwing so much in practice <laughs> that I, and not wearing an undershirt that the skin under my uh, my underarm is like like really bothering me, um, you know. There we went and like 
every single lineman was snapping the day we went. They were practicing snap technique because they're in the shotgun. They're practicing the pitch relationship. Because the pitch relationship when you're a shotgun quarterback on the edge is different from when you're a flex bone quarterback. When you take the snap, reverse out, put the ball in the fullback's belly, pull it, yank it, and get out on the edge. It's, it's different steps, different footwork, different relationship. So we'll see how this goes. We'll see how this goes. Um, a lot is going to change, I think, for Army on defense, too. There's going to be a little bit less of a possession-based system here because they're not going to be able to an extent to run that clock down and have a game where they where Army only has five possessions, where Army just where, and, and where you only have five possessions against Army, and they play ef- effectively keep away because they can keep the ball for 9, 10, 11 minutes when they're really, really cooking with fish grease. So pay attention um, to Army. I think Army is going to be an interesting story this year. I don't really have an inkling about how this is going to go. Jeff Bunk is a great football coach, but we'll see how this goes in year one. Jason, yeah, this could I be tough a, for you. I'm, I'm a bit distressed by um, Army, Navy, and Air Force possibly no yeah. longer being big spread underdogs as they've been for Knew at it. least 30 years. <laughs> Just magnificent against the spread. Um, and and I, f- I fear the, that free money outlet is, uh, is no longer available. Jason, um, you know what also is of note? The free money in the service academy uh, under games. That mm-hmm. may also be going the way the dodo bird. Um, Army Navy, it's, yeah. Army Navy itself. The game at the end of the year. Honestly, it like uh, you know, RIP our, our gambling winnings. I don't know how we'll ever financially recover from that game. Sometimes hitting the over, but that's a fascinating game now. Like before, it was fascinating because like these two teams have the exact same unorthodox style, and they know it inside and out. And you know, and it's, it all comes down to one mistake will decide. You know, one of the biggest games of the year every year. And now it's they're doing different stuff that's you know air force has done its own thing for a while now but all three of them doing their own thing is is pretty fascinating it's almost like a different rivalry angle to the rivalry too like navy you know if they win that game is going to like puff their chests out and say that we're the school we're the academy that still plays football the way it's meant to be played however they joined a conference they're the they're the sellouts cuz they joined a conference <laughs> the army no, that's has a great point as well uh, yeah, also that game tends to be played at a time of year where it's kind of advantageous to never put the ball in the air. You know, the weather in Philadelphia on like the first weekend of December is often very flex bone friendly. And so I actually don't know if this is one of the years when it's in Baltimore or the Meadowlands or wherever, but those places are cold too. So we'll see. Uh, it's funny because I guess that's not a reason for that's not a reason for Army not to make the change. But wow, like if Army throws two picks in Army Navy next year, do, <laughs> we'll never year, do they? It, yeah. <laughs> do they go back? I'd say, I'm just wondering about it. Uh, moving from the service academies, uh, I would open this one up to the class. What's a reasonable encore look like for last year's most surprising independent team, the Yukon Huskies, after going from perennial worst team in FBS territory to actually making a bowl game? It looks like the uh, SP plus win projection is four and a half. So let's say over under that. Perhaps. <laughs> I think it works. <laughs> I actually was going to say I might like to see another bowl here because if you look at the teams that they have scheduled, I don't think it's actually that hard to find six wins. Georgia no, it's State, not. Georgia State, which I've talked about as uh, one of the most fireable coaching staffs in the sport. <laughs> FIU. Rice, they could if, USF. If, if you look Boston at the way College, that Sacred Heart, UMass, that's yeah. like seven. If you look at the way this shakes out, they could honestly win six games in a row. Seriously, I mean, they could win. They could beat Georgia State, FIU, Duke, Utah State, Rice, and USF Duke in a row. Yeah, I don't know that before, they're going to be Duke. That's before Sacred Heart and UMass. So we're we're putting eight eight and four on the board for Jim Moore here. That's right. You heard it here first. <laughs> The world's uh, most UConn foremost does, UConn podcast right here, baby. UConn does have some players, on, in all honesty, uh, particularly on the defense. Uh, we talked about this player, Jackson Mitchell, a linebacker, before last year. He's good, and he was good last year. Had nine and a half tackles for loss, four and a half sacks. He had a pick. Uh, they have an offensive lineman, Christian Haynes, who has not missed a start in three years and is one of the best linemen in the country. Victor Rosa is a pretty effective running back, not necessarily an explosive running game at UConn, but one that kept their offense on schedule a decent chunk of the time. We can look because Godfrey's not here. 
we can just say, and I think we can say that this is a company line for splits into LLC. We're all the three of us as a corporate entity. So impressed by Jim Mora. I mean, we just think that this guy is like everything that's right about program building. That's right. At any level, and, any level of football. Yeah. Any level. And, of football. Yeah. As, as I the mean, really. uh, fill in Falcons fan, I will say Jim Mora should have been coach of the year last year. I'm aware of what TCU did. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm actually also wondering if UConn shouldn't go to a bowl back to back years. I think, like fair, Jason. Like if they win five, okay, like that's still better than they've usually been. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm not going to a lot of terrible teams on this they win, If they win five, and I I think that's where I'd have them. Uh, you think UMass could have a year in the next <laughs> I don't know three years like the one that UConn just had? No, I don't. <laughs> why 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 do you? <laughs> they have been building. They've been spending money on mm, football okay. infrastructure. Sure. Like uh, rats. So, okay, so probably not, but I'm wired to try to find – and we've we got a few UMass fans who listen to the show. I am wired to try to find possibility where where it is possible. Second year for Don Brown. Uh, that's interesting because he's a ball coach. He is good at drawing up plays on one side of the ball in particular. I think that's been proven. The Walt Bell hire was a big mistake. It was a terrible fit. Uh, you go and you hire like this shotgun option southerner to come up to Amherst. And, this Yankee. And run your team that way. Yeah, right. It's, it's a very Yankee elitist take. But it just – it was a weird, weird, weird fit, and it never got close to working. Year two for Don Brown. Obviously, he's been there before. Obviously, things have changed since he was there. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen this year. Uh, but I can't come up with a reason why if UConn could do it one year that UMass couldn't at some point have a bowl team. I just don't know when it's going to be. Tyler Rudolph, formerly of Penn State, playing safety at a high level. Brown has brought some Arizona transfers. Mark Pope, long ago top recruit at wide receiver, four-star, five-star, who had been at Miami and then with Dion, Jackson State. He is here now. Like, I'm not going to say that having one serious dude, one star on offense will, will fix things because they had Andy Isabella, who was a great college receiver, one of the most productive college receivers ever. And, you know, they went 4-8 and eight those years. But 4-8 and eight would be better than what they've been. Jordan Mahoney. 1-11 last year. Jordan Mahoney's a good player at DB. Um, remember, this is Don Brown. So they are only playing one way on defense and one way only. Uh, so, you know, if Jordan Mahoney, uh, Mahoney gets torched once or twice this season – Hey, that's because he is basically never, ever, ever playing off coverage ever. And eventually you're going to get got by a good wide receiver. So don't hold that against him. Uh, it's, it's, it's not your fault, Jordan. I, the, um, the UMass schedule, particularly that, that first week just jumps out. I, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, my, my beloved offspring, the Sickos committee, I'm certain they will agree with me that UMass at New Mexico State is a game of the year contender, a real tone God. setter. The uh, <laughs> whoever. tone setter. Yeah. Whoever, whoever manages to drop that one will be in line for something truly special this season. Um, and, you know, obviously. New Mexico State I, I, made I, a bowl last year. Lay off them. Hey, okay. All right. Easy, easy. All right. I, I, obviously, we hope for the best for all programs. I'm just saying it's a special game. It's, it's a sp- yeah, you guys, you guys report back about how New Mexico State and that UMass one being played? goes. Holler at your boy State. about that one. U- okay. UMass is That's doing the rare uh, playing both yeah. New Mexico teams. Um, despite being on the other side of the country situation this year. <laughs> They're going to both Albuquerque and Las Cruces. Uh, New Mexico is making the trip. Okay. So. That would be very interesting if a team from Massachusetts made two different flights to New Mexico in that's, the same that's didn't they? behavior. Yeah. D- they, d- I, I, they had a nuts, a similarly nuts, one of these that involved Hawaii, or maybe it was Hawaii going to UMass yes. a couple years ago. I think ago. Alex heard about this, the longest yeah. road trip in college football history. <laughs> Yep. Or the lo- the longest was. home and home, obviously. But yeah, yeah. Actually, I think they've played three times. What a messed up sport. <laughs> uh, I think the goal should be three wins for UMass this year. Uh, mm. And I think I can find them three. if I squint. Yeah. So I'm going to give you Mary Mack. Mary, <laughs> give me Mary Mack. Maybe, maybe UConn or New Mexico State. And maybe Penn Arkansas State. State. Penn State. Penn State, yeah. that's, but, that's two. But Arkansas Penn State State's is a given also on the board. Possibly, possibly pretty bad. We don't know that for sure, but... I think you. I think you should at least double your win total this year. Uh, you should find one between New Mexico State, Arkansas State, and UConn. 
double your win total and then do it again the next year and then do it again the next year so you're an eight win team by 2020 and mm-hmm. then Six. you're a national champion and the, yeah hey when the 12 team playoff expands umass gonna be right there okay for the whole group here uh let's talk about the last and uh, maybe the least notable independent the notre dame fighting irish sorry who i'm unfamiliar so uh, i checked the new york stock exchange this morning and you can possible? buy Notre Dame stock right now. <laughs> you can buy Notre Dame stock for 90 cents on the dollar compared to the day when Marcus Freeman was hired. 90 cents. It's down a little bit. It's not it hasn't tanked. You know, we haven't gone bed bath and beyond here. But the stock's trading a little lower. Um investors, you know, obviously questioning uh-huh. things in South Bend a little bit. Uh would you buy Notre Dame stock at 90 cents on the dollar compared to the, to where it was the day that Marcus Freeman was elevated into that job. Do I get to choose when I sell it, or is it just for this season? Yeah, you can sell whenever you want. Okay, yeah, I'll buy it. I'll buy it, yeah. I'll, I'll, and then I'll hang on to it for a while. I'm in, buddy. I, I don't know if in? I'm okay. I don't know if I'm 11 and 1 in, but the thing is, I was diamond hands from the jump, baby. No sell. Hodel gang, you feel me? <laughs> now, look, it got a little dicey the beginning of last season i'll tell you that because holy shit did this team look bad in the first three games of the season um it 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 did not spark joy but then and look i was at the clemson game last year like they figured some things out um and and you know we talked about this at some point in time last season and you know i I don't know if notre dame's going 12 and 0 this year but it's a it's a situation of First and foremost, we are really going to find out about whether it was Tommy Reese or whether it was the lack of receivers or whether it was the the quarterback situation not being very good. Again, I tend to think it was because the quarterback situation wasn't very good last year and the wide receiver situation wasn't very good this year. Um, so, So keep tabs on that. Obviously, the quarterback situation is changing significantly. They pride Sam Hartman out of Wake Forest, uh, and Sam Hartman is going to be their quarterback no longer Tyler Buckner. Tyler Buckner is at Alabama with Tommy Reese. I, they got some young pups at receiver. Uh, Jane Thomas, um, Tobias Merriweather, Dan Colsey. Um, you know, th- they're going to be young at that point. But we talked about this. Like, they have not – Notre Dame has not really produced a receiver, a burner receiver. They're all tight end sized. All yeah, man. receivers since, like, Golden Tate. All yeah, look like tight ends. Chase yeah. Claypool, Elise Mack, Miles Boykin, who who I'm not gonna say is like a one trick pony, but get get yourselves a fast guy who plays in the slot and runs away from everybody, and has like 11 catches for 147 yards once or twice a year. The one and like now, uh, besides Will Fuller, like they really have not had. Yeah, I forgot about him. I forgot about him. Sorry. Yeah, they they really have just not had a burner receiver since Golden Tate in the last count the amount of years so wide receiver is a position that i am sincerely curious about for notre dame you know i am not not concerned about the defense um i think it'd be pretty good on defense now i do think they need to get better up front on defense particularly because similar to don brown actually you know how they're gonna play on defense they are gonna they're playing man baby that's just it so to play that, you know, you want to be a little bit better up front to aid your corners and your safeties. So Benjamin Morrison's a great defensive back on the back end, um, but it, you do want to be a little bit better up front or at least more consistent. So they're going to have to find it up front. They do have some time to do so. Um, it's it's Navy and Ireland and then um, – uh, sorry, it's Navy and Ireland and then I think Tennessee State, uh, which Notre Dame is going to beat their chest about. Uh, hosting an HBCU team in week two, and then things turn up. Uh, they play Ohio State later than you think. They don't play Ohio State till uh, week five, I think, week four, week five. And then uh, they also get a Clemson um, uh, a Clemson ACC draw again. So they go to Death Valley in November. So, And then, obviously, there's USC. Load of coin flip games on this schedule. So could go whole lots of ways like my even, one even, like, even these sort of okay. middling games nc state louisville Pitt, as always of course but wake but yeah just uh 
<laughs> Pitt, not, not a whole as, lot of <laughs> Pitt, as is their annual right to struggle with Pitt. <laughs> Pitt, whether they're good or not, is still Pitt. But yeah, just uh, not a, not a lot of uh, not a lot of weeks off after um, after Central Michigan, Michigan, I guess. This is more of a long term question than a 2023 season question, but there's some reasonable wondering about like investment levels here, S- starting with the fact that you know Brian Kelly left for LSU and obviously didn't think that he could achieve the same things here that he could achieve there. We don't have to go back over that. But I thought it was weird when they tried to hire Utah's offensive coordinator, Andy Ludwig, in the offseason. And then, you know, they were pretty pretty open about it. They kind of put it on Fred Street. Like, they put Ludwig on the Jumbotron at a hockey game. The Athletic had reported with Freeman, like, looking very chummy. Like, all right, we clearly want to hire this guy. We're courting him. But he had a buyout. It was pretty big. And he didn't come. And Notre Dame didn't apparently didn't want to pay the buyout. Not entirely sure of all the dynamics that might have been at play there, but I don't know. Like that was a little bit of a "You're Notre Dame, what are we doing here?" moment I, for a lot of Notre Dame fans. And it was I will a say this: thing to wonder about. I will say this, Alex, and, and I get where you're coming from, but I so Notre Dame. If if you miss this, um, as a listener, Notre Dame's new athletic director is going to be Pete Bavacqua. He is basically doing a year in Jack Swarbrick's shadow before he takes over in 2024. Now, Pete Bavacqua is a television executive. In addition, to he also used to work for uh, the uh, US uh, USGA. Jesus Christ. Noted golfer doesn't know the uh, United States governing body. Work for USGA, work for NBC as well. If, if conference commissioners have all pointed to the direction of TV executive here in the last few years, as far as people who aren't native to college sports, Notre Dame doing this with their athletic director is also noteworthy as they continue their stolen valor independence. Um, Notre Dame obviously has its own television deal with NBC. You would expect a television executive to be pretty savvy at navigating the future uh, na- navigating Notre Dame through the future of how college sports television is going to adapt. Obviously, NBC is going to be more of a player in college sports television moving on as they have some Big Ten rights, Peacock, yada, 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 and they've been in cahoots with Notre Dame for decades on end. So when we talk about Notre Dame's revenue concerns, revenue gap, what have you, I look at a guy like Pete Bavacqua and say, you know, is, is he going to come in and have just a, a significantly different viewpoint on things than jack swarbrick who was very much i'm about the enterprise of college sports in general yada 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 now on the other hand notre dame probably wouldn't have hired pete bavacqua if he was you know shady you know uh brett yormark business guy so i don't necessarily expect them to go all the way to that side of the spectrum but it is a space to watch moving forward with the future of notre dame so no notre dame uh, bathing ape collapse uh, no i don't think so i don't see that coming jason do you feel any different about Notre Dame's independence as you've watched the realignment happen? It's not in indep- enough with Notre Dame's independence. Notre Dame is not an independent. Notre Dame has a vote in the ACC. They are a voting <laughs> member of the ACC. They play five ACC games a year and then three permanent games a year, USC, Stanford, and Navy out of conference. Let's they only it. have the space for four ga- a non non comp non whatever you want to call it. Notre Dame, I, I enough sure. with Notre Dame's Fine. independence. It they're, is they're stolen Listen, valor I, independence. I, I support Notre Dame's ethical non monogamy. Um, <laughs> as it has uh, pivoted that way from a, a long uh. past of being independent. Um, I support Notre Dame's polycule. Um, yeah, that's great. That's good for them. Um, as far as its continuance in the future, uh, I mean, if, I mean, as long as the money's there and like, you know, NBC going more in on college football, um, in general seems good for Notre Dame. Like they want 50, $60 million a year. And it seems like they can, you know, doesn't seem, doesn't seem uh, impossible to me. And like at that level, you're basically keeping up for the time being, um, and it seems like playoff access could only increase as the, literally the number of conferences shrinks, which means more at-large spots, yeah. most likely. Um, I mean, I, I've thought for a long time Notre Dame's in a great spot, and uh, 
seems like they are. You know, like no matter what the future of college football is, it'll include Notre Dame. Like if there's a big breakaway of 30 teams, Notre Dame will be one of them um, and can call itself independent. The independent of the Premier League or whatever. And, and you know, we'll give them a special <laughs> hat that says independent on it and they can pretend to continue to pretend to be that. But yeah, if I, you know, if, if I'm a Notre Dame fan, I feel fine. Just the two maybe contradictory things that I think are one that as realignment breaks in especially dumb ways as it has in recent weeks, I can't believe it, but I, I continue to find Notre Dame's not joining a conference as a full member to be more charming as if like, whereas 10 years ago, I thought, wow, like these elitists <laughs> just live like everybody else and just get over yourselves. But also, uh, the fact that they have a playoff vote is ridiculous, and that needs to be taken away from them immediately. Yeah, so that, that actually unbelievable. <laughs> it's, it, uh, remember, the playoff management committee is 10 FBS conference commissioners and fucking Notre Dame's athletic director. Yeah, it's and that's how it's worked it's since the BCS era. Like, they, <laughs> they're treated as a conference. And come Now, on, come I on. will say this. Moving forward as the playoff goes out into the open market – to be um, as far as playoff rights go into the open market after this these first two years of the twelve team arrangement, Pete Bavacqua being in that room will probably be a plus because of continued industry knowledge, being able to navigate the, the TV market, yada yada, and negotiate yada yada yada. But come on, like it is unreal to me that Notre Dame's athletic director and Notre Dame's president, Father Jenkins, get to be on both of the um, both of kind of the playoff you know, management and, and steering committee, whatever you want to call it. It's unbelievable. 